Good evening and welcome to the East Half District Council Human Resources Committee. Um, item number one on the agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? I don't believe we do, Chairman. Thank you. No, full house. That's great to hear. Thank you. Item two is to receive the minutes of the last meeting held on the 5th of August 2020. Uh, does that, do anyone have any corrections to make to these minutes? In that case, in that case, we'll move on. Oh, sorry, Councillor Alder. Oh, I'm proposing accepting them. Oh, thank we you. We haven't voted on them yet, have we? No, no, no. I was moving <laughs> on to that, but everything froze for me. I, I second that. <laughs> yeah, right. So, proposed by Councillor Alder, seconded by Councillor Newton. All in favour. Thank you. Um, item number three, Chairman's announcements. I, I don't have a lot to say. Um, as the situation continues and, and we enter another full lockdown, the pressure on the staff is uh, increasing and in consequence puts more pressure on the Human Resources Department and the staff. So I'd like to say um, well done to all the staff. They've worked incredibly hard to make an excellent service. Um, and it's been a very difficult year for them. Um, and recently, I know they've done very well to implement the the pay, pay, payroll award on time. So many thanks to the staff for that. Um, and thank you for all your efforts. So thank you. And the next item on the agenda is number four. Just me. Everyone else, am I frozen? Any declarations of interest? No blue hands, I can see there, Chairman. Nope, thank you. Sorry, everything's freezing for me. I don't understand quite why. Um, right, um, the no, item number five, the safety committee meeting minutes from the 3rd of August. Um, does anyone want to say anything about these or got any questions before we receive those minutes, please? Councillor Holder. Um, yes, I, I just wanted to um, ask a question, uh, Madam Chairman, on the uh, on 15.1 um, in connection with the severe weather policy. Uh, was there any outcome from your discussions? The staff were told to go away and think about it, I think, and uh, I just wonder whether there is now a firm policy or is it still in the making? Thank you. Well, just to just to update, we have held a, uh, another safety committee since these minutes. They were just not in time to bring to this committee and uh, Peter will be able to advise you that we finalised the policy at the safety committee uh, that was held in the late stage of October. Uh, thank you. Uh, while, while I'm speaking, can I just say a, a big thank you to um, Simon for the help he's given me as Chairman of Appointments and Appraisals at Sawbridgeworth. It's been very helpful and I'd like to just record that I'm grateful for your guidance and support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Oliver. Will Councillor Newton is trying to speak. Yeah, I was just going to say to the, the chair, I think the chair's on mute at the moment. Or I'm not sure if she's frozen, but Councillor Newton, I, I saw your blue hand there if you want to go ahead. Is it OK? Um, I, I just noticed, I think we're on agenda item five, aren't we? Safety committee minutes. Um, yes. At some point on 15.1, you were going to invite emails on people's thoughts and things. And I just thought, have you had their thoughts? And 
What are you doing? With yes, them? That, <laughs> that that was the, that was the point that Councillor Alder just explored, Councillor Newton as oh, well. It's the same. Sorry, it's the same point. You so got basically, there, Angela, what, before I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we've, we've 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 had another safety committee since. Um, at the stage, we were effectively sharing the policies and asked the members to email their thoughts in. Um, yeah. We also sought thoughts from leadership team, which is part of the process. Um, all of those thoughts were then brought together to a final draft, which was then approved by the subsequent safety committee in late October. So we have moved on. Um, these are just standard processes that you're going through there. We always seek feedback. And obviously it's particularly helpful if people can give them written feedback in relation to the document itself. So we tend to take that on email and then we bring the, the grouping of that to the next committee. So that's how it works in the safety is committee. Is it this committee you've brought it back to or another committee? No, so with health and safety policies, with the exception of the uh, main overarching health and safety policy and the statement, and the responsibilities section, which are approved by full council, uh, safety committee is effectively delegated to approve the health and safety operational policies that sit below the overarching policy. So um, you don't have those ones at this committee. Um, they're, they're dealt with by the safety committee and the union are also part of that safety committee. So it means the union are always part of that process as well. Should you ever wish us to provide you with copies of any of those policies? Of course, we would be willing to do so. I think I can access them, can't I? Yes, yes, of course you can. Apologies, yeah. yes. I just you meant if it would to. be of interest to you in any way, then obviously we'll, we'll happily pass them on. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. I can't quite hear you at the moment, Chair. I think you're still on mute. Perhaps if Brad could um, ask the Chair to unmute on Zoom, that might help. I'm trying. Rosemary, can you hear us? You're on mute. Are you stuck? Chair, perhaps if you hold down the space, but I'll temporarily unmute you sometimes, if that would help at all. No, okay. Who's vice chair? Sorry, I should know. I think the repeat the council ruffles is, but we we, we could um, the, you can normally uh, overwrite a mute from the host. Is that what you're trying at the moment? Thinking that's what Brad's trying to do currently. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, just to confirm. Yes, I've tried that a number of times, and it's not unfortunately working. Um, does council yeah. Bolton want to come out and back in again? Yeah, I was going to make the same suggestion. That yeah. would probably achieve it. I don't, I don't know if you can hear us even. Councillor Bolton, if you can hear us, we're suggesting that you log out. If you leave the meeting and then rejoin it, it will possibly overcome this mute hold that seems to have occurred. I will send an email to Councillor Bolton so she definitely gets yeah. that message. She's got a good husband. <laughs> she can hear then by that reaction. <laughs> Better be careful what I say then. Brad, whilst you're, you're doing that, it might be helpful if you, maybe you could make me co-host as well and I can try and unmute her, see if it works for me or for the different way around. And she's on another device. Okay. That's obviously she's coming on a tablet or a phone by the looks of the screen. But it hasn't quite connected, has it? Okay, that looks a bit more promising. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank goodness for that. I could hear you, but it was just frozen. I apologise. Right. Um, where are we up to? Sorry. I think uh, Simon had just finished answering Councillor Newton's question. Um, if there was any other questions on item five, if not, I guess we can move on. Right. And that's just for note. Um, that's just for receiving that. We're just receiving those minutes. Yeah. Right. OK. Thank you. 
Um, I have not got sight of everyone here, Will, on my on my mobile, so I need some help, please. No problem. That's fine. Thank you. Um, right, moving on to item number seven, the um, statistics, the human Is resources. Item, oh, are we on to item six. Oh, I beg your pardon. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Right, item number six six then um the health and safety quarterly statistics thank you very much peter some a uh, good report has anyone got any questions on it councillor yeah, uh, i don't know whether we're going to be brought in but i i was just um Last time in the minutes, which we're now not allowed to comment on uh, or any further than accuracy, you um, made a particular point, as you've done in your announcements this evening, about the strengths of the staff and holding things together and working so very, very hard. Um, and, of course, the dispiriting effect of this latest uh, news that we're into another lockdown. But... Um, and in uh, full council, I asked a question um, which led to the description of what the Environmental Services Committee uh, staff had actually put in to work with highways, making our town centres uh, openable. I just wonder whether um, we ought as a committee to restate your earlier thanks um, more formally in, in the minutes of the meeting here for all that's happened um, since the last meeting. Uh, and in particular here, this um, agenda item talks about the, on 9-1, the reopening uh, of various things which are now going to be closed down with that in mind. But I wonder whether there's anything, any other group environmental health, I meant to say, um, yeah. the, the, the people that I wanted to spotlight a bit. Is there any other particular group that we as a committee ought to write to more personally um, that suffered particularly hard times? It, it's quite difficult to pick out a group. I think yeah. there are many groups, if I'm if I'm fair and honest about that, in response. I mean, yeah. Environmental health have been very key, particularly in relation to the pandemic side of the pandemic management. But in terms of the, the commitment and the way that staff have adjusted and obviously the risk assessments that we've put in place, Peter in particular has been very key with them. Unison have really much supported that process and, and turned things around quickly. So we've had people out to work and we've had that done in a safe and controlled way but each service area has also played a part in that and of course it's the commitment of the staff in those areas that is, is key and as well as the support that we give so I would find it difficult I think I can understand why you would highlight environmental health and I think that is a helpful one to highlight if we're talking about particular increased workloads revenue and benefits must be mentioned because of all this discretionary grants etc that they've had to to look after but then uh, everyone involved in enforcement yeah. the outside officers there's, you know, there's, there's lots, really, I'm afraid. Yes, there's a danger, um, I'm sure, in <laughs> highlighting where it's not an absolutely clear uh, department that we need to highlight. But I wanted to be quite sure we hadn't overlooked um, anyone in particular. Um, and, uh, Chairman, could I... Yeah, just... actually, J Jackie's just reminded me that obviously customer services cross across all of those services and therefore they're taking the, the front end and the phone calls as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I, th I think an all staff, thank you, with particular thanks maybe to revenue benefits, customer services and environmental health would be quite, a, 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 as well as, if you'll allow me to say it with him on, on the Zoom call, the health and safety officer for, for the support would, would be nice to highlight. Yes, yes, that's a really good. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's, um, that was a really good suggestion. Chairman, with the, the reopening of Wallfields, there's one particular little detail that is causing um, difficulty to two people I know in my ward, possibly others, and that's the prevention, and I think it's got to be, but I just want to refer to it, of the kiosk, the payment kiosk, inside the first entrance at Wallfields, which has been put out of operation. It's the Last but one bullet point in 915. I understand all that, but I, I just want to say that the implication for these two families who are quite separate from each other uh, is quite grave. Um, one came to me to say uh, that he wanted to pay 
rent, I think, in that uh, particular case. And he couldn't, but he had spent what he should have paid on the rent and he knew he had. Um, he, he, it was just one of those bad managers uh, that we, we all know about. Uh, he was open about it, but it's landed him in quite a problem. I, I just wonder whether there is an alternative to the machine, as it were. I can see the so reason. I think just just to respond to that straight away, because the alternative which is available and should should if it's not been made aware, I think we need to make sure that there's clarity on that is yeah. that people can go to the post office to make the same payment. Yeah, so we, we haven't closed that believing that that's closed off the only route. And, and there is an opportunity here really for what's being described as channel shift, which we're obviously trying to, to take as much as we can, that we have found that people have made the adjustment because of the pandemic. Obviously, it had to be closed for a period of time and the demand effectively appeared to have really dropped off. And, and, and obviously, then you've got a touchscreen operation. You're not going to get involved in, in that process if you don't need to. And it appeared that we had alternative routes. So I think uh, Peter might want to add to that, uh, Peter Dickinson, but, you, you know, there are, the, there's the health and safety aspects alongside the aspect and opportunity to, to yeah. form some channel shift, to be frank. Thank you. Peter, is that all right? Uh, yeah, and I was just going to say good luck with wait more uh, with that particular ambition um, to make wait more castle accessible. Um, that's that's going to be a really difficult challenge for those taking it on. But yes, that's all, Chairman. But Councillor Ruffles, would you like us to provide some more information about the alternative ways that cash can be paid now that the kiosk is closed, just so um, that that but, can be passed um, on? I've given the advice that you've just repeated here, so I think okay. I've done all I can, and I guess it's a very very small minority. Yes, are as as affected as badly as. I nearly mentioned the names, um, but nevertheless, it's it's significant in that particular in those two cases. No, no, I do understand, which is why I wanted to make sure the alternative routes yeah. are available. Yeah, I've told okay. them about post office. Thank you, thank you. So um, yes, can we please minute um, Will? Can we minute um, our thanks to the staff and especially those departments? Uh, the revs and bands, environmental health, customer services covering everything, and, and the health and safety work that's happened within the human resources department as well. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if Thank you can you. see on your screen, but Councillor Newton's got a hand up. I got, yeah, I, it's different on the phone. So, Councillor Newton. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just out of interest, there is a, quite a number of um, post offices closing for various reasons. Refurbishment, um, uh, rain coming through sea ceilings, um, lack of staff, pandemic, etc. cetera. Um, now post offices are picking up what people are meant to do in the banks because the banks are all closed and they obviously are picking up the stuff from his hearts. So I, it's just, I'm just flagging that for the moment because I don't know if it's just one of those things or it's a bit of a trend. I, what I think is worth saying here is the vast, vast, vast majority are paying online. The, 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 the need to pay cash and actually partly because of COVID, people don't want to use cash. So we, we, although we Whatever. are referring a, 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 a proportion on, uh, it is a very, very, very small proportion. I believe there are other opportunities, not just the post office, potentially the pay point uh, side of things. So. I think there are we're not excluding anyone, and that has been taken into account up front. And in the end, this this matter would probably have to be referred to the head of communications who's who's brought this in. And that you know, Peter has supported the health and safety aspect, which is why we've referred to it. I was but just following on from uh, Councillor Ruffles and what he said, but that's not actually what I wanted to say. Um, in agenda item six, I just wanted to ask a question. You have a very nice. Um, uh, chart on accident total and i was just looking there it's on page 33 and that was interesting and i know that a lot of accidents are reduced because things are just not open but could you tell me i don't know much about grange pallets but why does it have such a high accident total just out of curiosity really higher footfall believe it or not it's, it's a very oh, it's popular 
it's a very popular facility. Um, the other pools by um, virtue of their size, Leventhorpe, Ward Freeman and Fanshawe are much smaller, so that the wow. offer is smaller, whereas um, Hartham and Grange Paddocks um, enjoy a larger turnover. Um, they're more centrally located in the two towns, Stalford and Hartford, um, whereas the others tend to be uh, slightly further out from the towns, but they are smaller facilities. So that's simply the nature of it, the fact that they've got a higher, a higher turnover um, and they have a bigger offer. They've got larger gym uh, facilities, um, larger, larger pool facilities. So that's what accounts for the, the, the increase, the larger ones. When you see those two uh, facilities, um, yeah. it, it's right. a bit of an eyebrow raiser, but that's simply because they're larger. Fine. Yeah, Thank no you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, I'm afraid I can't see any hands on when I'm on my mobile. So. No, I can't see anyone's hand on the screen. All right. So no other questions. So um, that report is for noting, I believe. So we'll take that report as noted. Thank you very right. much. You. Um, item number seven, human resources quarterly statistics. Who's, is this Vicky, is so this yours? That's going to be Vicky, but just to say thank you to Peter, because I know he's going to, he's going to drop off Oh, now, you're going so. now, Peter. Peter, thank you very much for all your hard work. We do appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Right. Um, so the um, human resources quarterly statistics. Have we got any questions on this? Again, a good report. Thank you. Well, I can't see. Oh, Council Ruffles' his hand, I can see. And he's on mute. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Council Ruffles, you're on this mute. This is going <laughs> really well, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sickness item on 3-3, uh, uh, just uh, generally. Um, down on all sickness, but I just wonder what the intelligence is uh, from Simon behind that is it because there is less infection when people are working at home are they not reporting illness that they would otherwise report or you know what what's the story i, I, I think i mean councillor Cance, demont raised this um actually in comparison to stuff he was picking up in because he works in the employment sector as well and um yeah i think there is a definite drop in the overall employment sector of sickness because people are muddling through more than they would and i think it's quite telling that actually getting in the car and having to make a journey or getting onto public transport when you're not feeling well can be quite a barrier to wanting to work that day if you see what I mean whereas if you can get straight on to work possibly have a bit more of a rest at lunchtime you, you you tend to keep going um so yes the short reality is the 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 working from home a more consistent approach across staff is definitely having a reduction on sickness absence i don't think it's a non-reporting issue in some ways quite the opposite we are i think quite good at getting staff to tell us if they are feeling unwell from the point of view of symptoms in relation to covid so as a result there is a little bit more dialogue on those matters um i think also and it's a bit of a strange one that also the sort of well-being measures that we we you know, there haven't really been additional. We had good well-being measures already, but the fact that we're talking so much about well-being and we're talking so much about talking to each other and keeping them engaged with each other, I think has also helped. So again, you you will muddle through a bit more because you feel you can tell your boss, actually, I'm not feeling too great today, but I'm, I'm here, I'm going to get on with it. And, and, you know, people are, if that makes sense. So I think it, yeah, it's, it's the agile working has allowed people to feel that they can manage better sort of maybe more minor illnesses as well as work at the same time, whereas that's more right. challenging, particularly when you have to go through, you know, sometimes quite a difficult journey to get to work that that can particularly wipe you out by the time you've got to work if you're not feeling too well. Obviously, Thank, I mean, so. you. Thank you. Now, that helpful, Councillor Ruffles? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Any other hands up or questions? Doesn't look like it to me, Chan. Great. No, I was going to mention the statistics and also the fact that um, the the long term absence is um, um, is down and to a large degree, I think, to two employees. That that's right, isn't it? In three point three point nine. Yes. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that can't be helped. Um, page 52, it was good to see all the, um, the, the courses available. That, that's excellent. And the fact that people, so people are still attending courses even during lockdown. They're, they're online courses, I assume, are they? Yeah, yeah majority are based on Zoom. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. Councillor Newton, that's your hand up, is it? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, there were just two things. One, just to humour me. Sorry. <laughs> That's knowing. <laughs> Always pleased to hear me. Uh, 3.16 Sustainability Policy and Projects Officer is really popular. And apparently, you've got a lot of people going for this one. So I don't know what happened to the other one. What specifically is that that made it so popular? Or is it just the market at the moment because of the pandemic that there's so many people? going for this one job what's behind the scenes i think there's a, a combination of um um sustainability is very topical i think more people want to get involved in in that type of work um and perhaps so a, a combination of what what's happening in, in the job market that you know we are seeing an increase in the number of applications generally for our job um so a combination it is a combination of both, yeah. And and the other thing about event courses, about 29 people, am I correct in seeing on page 53, about 29 people have attended courses? Is that correct? Um, bear with me. Because about five events. 3.4.5, yeah. Yeah, about 29. Yeah, top of page 53. Is that 29 people out of all the people at East Hearts? So this is um, a, a slight change on the previous report. We've just reported on this quarter. So it's 29 people just for the quarter, just for quarter two, just which quarter. is July to September. Whereas I think before we were doing a cumulative um, period. Yeah. And that's okay. changed slightly for this, just this quarter. So that's why it looks thank a little you. different. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Simon, you got your hand up? Yeah, also just to clarify that these are the in-house courses. Um, so there is there is a slight reduction to, compared to what you'd normally see in a quarter, partly because of the shift to have to do things on a Zoom basis. Um, I think elsewhere in the report, we've advised that some of the hands-on practical courses have still been postponed. And Peter is looking at how safely we can bring those back in. Obviously, the latest lockdown wouldn't suggest that is now the time to start moving back to those. But um, the yeah, there will be a variety of other courses. And I, and I know that's been happening quite consistently that people have attended um, on on Zoom and uh, various other processes, particularly individually, but there's also been a number of wellbeing talks, et cetera, that people have participated in as well, and they're not listed as an in-house course. So I wouldn't want you to think there was a, a, a significant drop, but of course there has been some drop because some courses are not suitable for uh, online. They can only be done in a practical way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can, was that it, Councillor Newton? Right. Councillor Dumont, you've got your hand up. Hello, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, probably a question for Simon. It's just on the low numbers of turnover figures. Do we put that down to the pandemic and perhaps people being less inclined to move jobs or wanting to stay in, in a safe position? Or do you, is there other reasons, you think? Well, I, I think... Uh uh, you know, Vicky should, probably should answer this, but just to give her a little heading, um, it, we, we already saw a reduction in our turnover quite significantly at East Hearts. And I think we need to remember that because I've had that comment elsewhere as well, that it, is this all down to the pandemic? And in fact, it was, you, you can't say it's a good thing that you've got your turnover down because that's just the pandemic. And actually we brought the turnover down before we went into the pandemic and quite significantly. Um, but yes, there is absolutely no doubt that the continuation of uh, it to drop even further um, and I would imagine now if there was a sector comparison, but there isn't one available, that you would find the whole sector has dropped because, of course, people aren't leaving jobs in this level of uncertainty and many people are losing jobs. And obviously we are quite fortunate in many ways to be in a local authority, public sector environment where those things happen if they do happen a lot more slowly, um, as opposed to the private sector where there will be high levels of non-voluntary non turnover taking place at, at this stage. 
And in fact, Thank some you. of that is, is even fudged further by the fact that a lot of them are being asked just to reduce their hours instead of leaving. So there are some strange practices going on at the moment. Okay. Vicky, well, did you want you to add it. anything to that or not? Um, just to add that I'd like to think that all the wellbeing measures that we've put in place also has had, had an impact on um, retaining staff. It's hard to measure, but I'd like to think so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have we got any more hands up? No, I'll take mine down. No. Great. Thank you. Um, so that report is also for noting, isn't it, I think? Thank you. We'll take that report as noted. Move on to item eight, which is the annual staff equalities report. I'm going to be taking that paper, Madam Chairman, because uh, Claire Kirby right. doesn't work on a Thursday, so she's not attending. Right. I believe Sorry. Vicky will, will now be departing us as well. Thank you. Do you mind? Oh, if thank you, Vicky. Please. Thank you for your help. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Right. So, um, well, hopefully everyone's read the report. Do you need to add anything or are we moving straight to questions? Yeah, I'd be happy to take questions, Chair. Great. So, Councillor Dumont. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, there was one potential typo, I notice. Um, right. <laughs> EDI is on uh, page 98. Um, I think it says first impressions, interview and, interviewing and testing, first impressions. And I think the third sentence, if you have a strong impression, uh, first impression, it's important that you are aware of this and do let it influence the next impressions. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's do not let it influence the next impressions. Thank you, Councillor Dumont. Um, yeah, absolutely right. Sorry, we've missed that one because it's, it's not even a report to you. That is an appendix that we wanted to share with you as our good work. So obviously we've let ourselves down there. I do apologise. No, no, no. Just, no, it's, 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 just it's, a typo. It's just yeah, a typo. it's all it is. It's, I just thought I'd let you know. There is a, there is a couple of things um, and I'll keep them brief. But um, I think it's nice to see some of the things that have been spoken about in the past, Simon, for example. Yeah. There now appears to be an opportunity for name blind software to be, to be implemented. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the action plan. Um, so just to really say that, yeah, that, that, that is a positive thing to see that. Um, I can also see on page 95 of the agenda pack or page 33 um, of this report uh, or these recommendations with regards to mental health first aiders. Yeah, it's the last point at the bottom. Yeah. And you're developing uh, some training. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably really more important this year than it's ever been um, for people who are working from home. And we sort of touched on sickness and, and supporting people and how they're reaching out to their managers. But is that something that's accessed very often by staff and, and are staff fully aware of how to access it? And do we, how does that work? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, it, I think the access levels in the office were better. To be, to be really honest, um, we have publicised and we have reminded again, and it, that it is part of our wellbeing section who they are. And there is a, uh, an, you know, a mental health first aid email group, meaning that somebody can email. There are, you know, there are different ways to do it. We have actually been talking about this in our own wellbeing group to suggest that we actually advertise some open sessions where people can sort of drop in. Obviously, you'd want those sessions to be individual, but we, we would just put some slots available. And then if someone signs in, obviously, then it becomes a closed slot. So we can try and encourage it further. Obviously, we, we also have the employee assistance program. So there is the opportunity for people to be using that. And again, that is something they do directly. So we wouldn't necessarily know if they have, which is important in terms of the confidentiality, of course. But um, yes, it generally, people, there's no doubt that everyone's aware of the mental health first aiders and we have a good number of them. Um, it's a shame, actually, Vicky has just dropped off because she leads our mental health first aiders and she, and she is one herself, as is Helen Farrell and Emily Cordwell from the HR team. So there's, there's a few. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear that Jackie's part of our mental health first aid team as well. I'm not sure, but uh, no, she's not. OK, but there's certainly a couple of the union reps that are as well. So um, there's, a, there's a good range, there's a good choice of people, and um, we are looking to grow that further with some training, um, which I think was covered in the, the quarter of the report as well, to say we're looking into some further mental health first aid training as well. If I could just Thank you very much. just to actually say that when I've been speaking to members, um, 
there is some very positive feedback on members actually talking to the East Hearts mental health first aiders. And I know a lot of um, staff have actually used them. And I must admit that I've had quite a few good chats with Vicky, as we seem to sort of like, when we're catching up about things, we can have an off the record moan about each, our own issues. And it's been very, very helpful to have someone to sort of bounce things off because working at home can get very, very lonely as such, you know, and not having the office camaraderie you know, gets a little bit tiring at times. So sometimes just, you know, having a little phone call with someone is very, very helpful. And I know that lots of members of staff do use the mental health first aiders buddy system quite a lot. And also there is the My Unison, uh, which is the Unison support, welfare support system. And I know various people have used that as well. So we've got quite a lot going on at East Hearts that's very positive. That is very positive. Yeah. As I said, I just worry this, particularly in the pandemic and people working from home, it can be that little bit easier for colleagues perhaps to miss things, you know, or, or to miss some subtle signs that someone's struggling more than you might if you're face to face. But as you said, it, it, it appears that we, as a council, we are doing a lot and there's a lot of things in place. So that's very, very positive. Just, just to you. add to that as well, we, we've done lots of top tips for the managers. In fact, East Hearts Together, which Jackie's part of as well, um, we've produced a, a home working guide. And actually some of the points on that are why we actually are insisting to some extent that people are having video catch ups, because just what you're saying, it's quite easy if you're maybe just on the phone or just communicating an email to not really be noticed in terms of that you're not yourself. And actually, the, I know people will say video is not the same as face to face, but it's a damn sight closer than, than not, if you see what I mean. And and we've, we've certainly encouraged that. Um, and, it, and it's things like making sure people are turning their videos on. They are actually engaging, having those regular team meetings on video for that reason. We've got quizzes going on in sort of outside of working hours to get some of that engagement as well. There's a whole range going on. I mean, it, there's no doubt about it. I think everyone has had moments and uh, everyone will have moments more, if you see what I mean. So it's an ongoing task, this. Um, but it, it is one we are taking very seriously and in fact I've been talking to Councillor Wiley who in particular is key that we promote some of the Samaritan services so we're, we're, we've done some of that already but we're going to be adding that into the wellbeing section as well because obviously that's another form of someone that will listen to you and just listen to you in the case of the Samaritan so yeah. No, and I, I do agree with you Simon just on the video calls that it's not the same as face to face but I think I do think they are important. Yeah. Thank you. Was that it Councillor Demand? Thank you. I'm done thank you. Councillor Alder, thank you. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, yes, it, it's it, on the uh, the uh, section on religion and belief, the uh, the uh, bar chart there. Um, do I take it that um, pagan Sikhs and Muslims there aren't any, or is it that there's just one, or just one Hindu? Because Certainly Muslims need to have time where they have their prayer sessions. Obviously, with with the people working at home, that probably uh, is easily more easily done. But if they're in the office, do we have uh, facilities for them? Um, to... Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe there are. There is. There. There isn't none. Uh, just to be clear, um, I haven't managed to get to the right page quick enough to answer that question. But in terms Sorry. of the prayer room, I can confirm for you that we have a, what we call a reflection room so that it, it is there for people to pray in. And there are facilities nearby, such as the toilets, etc., which you potentially need from a Muslim prayer point of view. The um, In terms of uh, people's ability to pray during work, obviously, we have a flexi scheme for, for the majority of our staff. It's pretty much only leadership team that don't have that. Um, people often misunderstand that the requirement to pray five times a day means you need to pray five times a day at work. It doesn't. It's obviously a 24 hour period that that requirement is such. So there is flexibility in our work practices to allow people to take time out and to pray. And there is a space for them to do that as well, um, particularly at Warfields. So yeah, I think we're OK on that front. Um, Thank but... you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? That you did... Right. Councillor Newton. Yeah, I, I'm sure this is the case because I was what I, I was looking at the one with the sex and ethnic origin, age, religion and belief, disability, status, sexual orientation. I mean, I dream of a world one day where we don't even have to even refer to those things. It's, it will be taken as a given. But for the moment, this is a, a, a anonymous, isn't it? I mean, nobody has to declare 
their status? They have the privacy and the right to say no. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they have the right. They have the right not to declare. We strongly encourage them to share, for the reasons that we are part of the Equality Act, and the Equality Act expects us to analyse it. And there's nothing worse yeah. than than chasing something you already have. So it's actually, but to be clear, these figures are very much global figures and they will always be shown as global figures. When I say that, that the individual shares, the individual information is with HR, it's not with their line manager, it's not with anyone else in the organisation, it's just with us Good. in HR. And uh, as I always uh, joke with employees, we really haven't got time to start drilling into what religion Jackie is or what religion Vicky is. It's just not funny enough, we're quite busy in HR, so we don't care about your sexual orientation. It really or your matter, no, it shouldn't really. But matter. it does matter where it does. Well, it does, does particularly for you matter. To, to yeah, it does matter figures. to actually. There's nothing yeah. worse than having to create action as to say you need to do something when actually you've already got a strong, you know, yes, I get of, of gay staff, for example, or you know, yeah. uh, Muslim staff, etc. Um, we we will keep working to to obviously have our profile more in line with the communities and obviously in religion we, we're showing very well, but. You know, there are still a high proportion of not knowns in our data for the reason that you said is many staff. And I totally sympathise with those staff. This has been an issue for 15, 20 years since since we've been reporting on these matters is people really don't feel it's any of your business as an employer to know. And I, I do totally sympathise with that, which is why we're very keen to reassure these are global figures only. And we're not interested in individuals. We just want to know about our staff mix and obviously try and have a mix that serves the community, that represents the community that we serve on me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dumont. Yeah, I, just, I, I believe that, just to clarify something, I believe that is the point of monitoring the, these different characteristics, which is confirmation that we're not discriminating. It's confirmation that we do re reflect the society that we serve. And these are for, for no other purpose. They're not um, to ask people or put them in an awkward position or ask their personal life, it's to ensure that as a council, we have done our equalities job correctly. That's my understanding of monitoring. Uh, that, Not to highlight individuals. It's, no, it, that's, it, that's correct, but an individual will never necessarily see it like that. And in fact, most individuals don't. And as I say, most individuals, and I've, I've, I've trained about a thousand staff in the area of equality and diversity personally, and I discuss this matter and I always use those sessions as a way of consulting with them on this subject, because it's very good to hear what people think and then to relate that into your plans, et cetera. And most people don't actually really feel there is a place for reporting in particular sexual orientation and religion to the workplace. And, um, and, and, and that's actually what message we get back. And all I'm saying is we will always have a degree of frustration. In fact, to have only 21.2% not known is, is pretty impressive in the workplace. And, and that's what I would just point out to you. But when you have a percentage as much as one fifth, then obviously all of your other figures have a, have a level of distortion. Thank you. Um, anyone got any other? Councillor Ruffles. Thank you, Chairman. I, I'm happy to propose the well, I've got a couple. Yeah, I've got a couple more um, questions to ask. Yeah, so have I. Uh, but proposal, I, right? I will propose A, B, and C. So it's on record, and someone may second later, um, Chairman. But what I and I welcome the proposal to report annually in July in future and get mm -hmm. us into a, a better pattern. Um, my my question is really a, a fundamental one. Um, the report makes really interesting reading each year um, just for us to get the feel of our own council and you know I, I, I love that kind of read. Uh, I keep learning that we are um, employ more women than men 72 percent to 28 percent always and that we have a disproportionate number of men leaving which is uh, uh, interesting for us and that our speciality it seems to be in employing 50 year olds to 64 year olds as a, a thing. Um, but my, my question is what, what actually happens to this? Is someone going to come along and tell us we're going wrong at any point in the future? Who inspect, who inspects um, this report and 
Well, theoretically, the Equality and Human Rights Commission could choose to have a look at your compliance with the Equality Act. And obviously, what we are doing here by producing this report is part of our compliance with that act. So as a as a local authority and the size of organisation that we are, we're expected to publish this data. And obviously, as part of publishing that data, we, we include an action plan. But fundamentally, it would be it would be evidence potentially if people were suggesting discrimination for example that we are complying with the Equality Act and we are an employer that takes equality serious and this is the work that we've done it, it doesn't it doesn't get reported externally uh, we publish it obviously on our on our website when I say that but it's it's open for people to view but there isn't I, I don't think I think they just choose people that they'll go and have a further look at but Clearly, if they were to look at you and find you didn't have an equality report, that would be likely to lead to them wanting to ask for more information. And, you know, then there could well be penalties or consequences because it is a requirement under the Equality Act for us to publish this level of data. I think the other point if, if, which I would like to say, because you, you flagged something that's quite important here, is this is the staff equality report. So it does tell you about our staff profile and about the people that want to work for us in terms of the recruitment side. Um, the, the council has uh, appointed now a two-day-a-week equalities officer who is a full-time officer at, at Hertfordshire County. Um, they've just recruited a new one at Harts County, sorry. And um, they will be leading more work around the equality impact assessments and the equality side in relation to our, our general services. So you will see more taking place in relation to equalities as that appointment begins to progress. So all I'm really saying is watch this space. And, 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 you know, we know we're giving you good information on the staff quality but there'll be even more quality information relating to our residents and to our services that will be coming on stream and obviously in HR we're keen to work with this person when they arrive to, to strengthen some of our stuff which you would have seen referred to in the action plan. Thank, thank you Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I just want to add that I think that Appendix B is just so so good uh, in very simple terms. Oh, I wish I had it 30 years ago yeah. when I was doing a lot of interviewing. The unconscious bias recruitment yeah. tick off list. It's a oh, really sorry, and actually, you've given me another highlight that. I should make is we did actually explore buying in an external unconscious bias product. Actually, when we saw it, it wasn't very good. Unfortunately, there's a lot of poor products in the equality world. Um, I will just highlight a lot of people say they're good at this stuff and they're not actually, they can be quite dull and boring and actually not very engaging. And Claire Kirby is the author of the uh, tips that you've seen on unconscious bias. And I know she, she actually found it quite a challenge to put that together and she'll yeah. be very pleased to hear that, yeah. that you've, you've enjoyed it and you see it as a useful tool. And, and, to take it a step further, we've incorporated those tips, etc., into the equality uh, mandatory course that all staff do. So we're not just going to focus on recruiting managers about unconscious bias. We're spreading that into the general equality course that we do. We've revised that with uh, various additions. Helen Farrell has been working on that this week, in fact. And the, and the new round that goes out in November will include mandatory equality training, as it always has, but that will now include unconscious bias. So it's a further support for the suggestion, you know, that there may be bias at various stages in the recruitment process so um, we are we are continuing to support the, the removal of unconscious bias and as Councillor Demont has highlighted um, I believe I've got sufficient uh, money back from the system provider so that we can buy a third party product that will allow us to do proper online recruitment that will help massively with the equality data which has started to drop off as we've improved our application form and had to keep that form separate and um, if we have a proper software product it will automate that detachment for us as well as doing the name blind recruitment that we, we, we would all like to see but is very difficult if you don't have a system that will do it for you so um it's it's, it's, yeah. it's all going, it will hopefully keep going up that that good news story if you see what i mean <laughs> yeah thank you i was going to mention about the unconscious bias training as well and the confirmation bias as well I'm really really excellent i've done unconscious bias myself and it's, it's really worthwhile doing so i'm really pleased to see that's coming on board thank you can you um Pass on our thanks to Claire Kirby for that. Yeah. Uh, I know it'll, she'll have benefited, but everyone's going to benefit from her work. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, I'm really personally very pleased about the name blind recruitment um, that we can start looking at doing that. Thank you. The one other thing I wanted to mention was on the bottom of 68, page 68, that's the, um, the action plan about performance. Um, your performance development 
reviews and doing spot checks on oh, yeah. those. Um, that, that must have been quite a challenge been doing the development, the um, the performance development during lockdown. Um, presumably it's been doing done remotely. Um, how uh, yes. is that coming on? I mean, have, well, have well, you most, got... most appraisals were at least be begun, sorry, or personal right. development. Uh, um, so what do you call them? PD? Yeah, no, I'm getting confused. Yeah. Oh, performance appraisals, sorry, that's where the P yeah. was. Um, most most were at least begun before lockdown commenced because our appraisal period is effectively December through to March. So okay. a number had started. I personally have done some on Zoom and that's where managers shifted to where they needed to as a result of the pandemic. So yes, they, they have continued. Um, just to say that the spot checking and the sort of collation of development needs, et cetera, is, is an ongoing action. That's an action yep. that we've done for some time. Um, so and, and yes, we've continued to do that. Um, the the completion rates on appraisal did drop off a bit due to the pandemic. I would be wrong to say mm -hmm. that there wasn't some problems there. But, you know, that has been picked up and um, right. we are moving into a new round. Um, we don't have a new uh, appraisal form this year. That's something we will have next year when the competency work has been developed, which I, I know flagged on the next report. But, um, yeah, the, 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 the key point as well is that one to ones are, keep, are continuing to happen regularly and they are being held very much on Zoom as well. Great. Thank you very much. So unless anyone's got any other questions, doesn't look like it to me. Um, is everyone happy to um, to take the recommendations on block, as it were? Councillor Ruffles, you were uh, you were going to propose them? No second. Uh, no proposal. Three. And second by Councillor Dumont. Thank you. Can we have a vote all in favour of those, please? Let's okay, well, if you've got everyone, yeah, that's all right. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to where are we? Number nine, um, human resources and payroll team update. Um, really good report. Thank you very much. Um, special well done for the payroll pay award. That's a big achievement to get that done out in the time. Well done. Um, you really deserve some praise for that. Can't have been easy. Um, yeah, that's particularly thanks to Jill Coleman as the payroll manager and Colin really? yeah. um, But Jill, Jill, just to share a small, small bit of amusement, will always tell me we'll, we'll do our best. But we don't think we'll be able to make it, and you know full well she'll work all weekend to make sure it's done. So um, yeah, she is she is a very big asset for us at the um, the council, and um, yeah, she she will always want to deliver, and um, and yeah, they they both manage that as well as obviously the HR support that was provided. Yeah, as well. that's great. And the East Hearts Together work going on. That's good that that's carrying on despite everything else going on. Um, yeah, really I, got your, yeah. We we have had to move a few deadlines. There are a few bumps in the road, and again, it wouldn't be wrong to suggest not, but. Um, yeah, I think we can all understand why that is and, and, and the need to focus on, on emerging matters as they emerge. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question um, I had was about the staff survey, page 110, 4.1.6, the staff survey. Um, it, it's really important to have staff surveys, obviously, um, and I know you wouldn't not want to do it. it is the time frame realistic, given everything else you've got on your plate? Okay, so um, I'm just reminding myself what I wrote in the report because it is a moving 4. piece. 4.1.6, page 110. Yeah, no, no, I found the right place. Um, so what we are doing now, so I've just seen whether I actually this was an up-to-date completely upstate because I say okay. we, we, we've discussed this at leadership team so there we've decided that we want to rerun the well-being survey we, we have recognized that right. as much as actually staff have done well we've also seen staff start to struggle more you know the longer yeah. this goes on the more impact it has in short so we yeah. want to take the barometer or the temperature or whatever phrase you want to use again in terms of well-being and um, we've talked to the comms team about that and what they and also the need to run a staff survey in December and what we've determined is we're going to run a joint well-being and full staff survey because we don't want survey right. fatigue no um, Vicky's actually yeah. developed the questions and um, hopefully next week I will get away from other work that I've been focusing on and I will be able to have a full look at those questions then they'll be considered by the leadership team and then we'll look to get those out basically so we're going to run the staff survey in-house as well as the well-being survey 
the wellbeing survey, as you may recall, had a 93% return rate, which is pretty yeah. astounding. Um, so staff did engage in that. They appreciated the follow up and the quick turnaround. And we want to use that approach as well as our one team approach, where we're asking people to work together as one team. And obviously, if there are problems to share that and for us to as a team resolve those problems. So we want the staff survey to be very much part of that mantra and um, and to engage staff in their views. And we've had some issues just to make you aware in the past where we've had some negative feedback in a staff survey and we've never been able to really boil down to where those issues were because they were never sort of shared or voiced. So it is going to be a different approach for staff. Um, some staff are going to find it difficult you know, to effectively share their name, et cetera. So we need to look at that and handle that with care. But this is very much about getting good feedback and then follow up as a result of that feedback to get things better or, you know, people to be clear on things if they're not, et cetera. You know, it depends what comes out. And obviously with the well-being side, it's very much to ensure that we're giving staff the support that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, very, uh, I know Councillor Alder mentioned it earlier, 4.3, the service is being provided to external organisations. Good to see that that's growing. Uh, so well done, because that, that's more time out of your day doing those services. Thank you very much. Has anyone got, anyone got any other comments or questions from anything in this report? It's, it's an excellent report, I think. But... Hello, Jim. So, who is that? Sorry. Jim. Chairman, um, can you hear me? Who can you hear it? me? It's Councillor Ball speaking. Right, <laughs> go on, Councillor Ball. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, um, I hadn't gone to sleep. I was inwardly digesting everything that was said. Um, sometimes I'm a better listener than I am a talker. Um, yeah, if I can take you to um, the item payroll team regarding the Hartford Theatre closure. Um, right, what page are you on, do you 10... know? Yeah, 113. All right. right. Mm -hmm. Yep, I've got it. Um, yeah, um, I think we're making 10 people redundant. Two of those are full-time and eight are part-time. Um, it, it's my opinion. Um, is that the right move to see their time out for um, uh, to be employed for the last 12 weeks for a COVID marshal? I mean, in the height of this pandemic, um, can I, can people's I, um, can I, can I respond straight away because there's been movement since that report was written as well, and I'd rather bring you straight up to date and then see if you want to okay. make the point. Okay. So, right. uh, to, to be clear, okay. there are ten there are ten staff at risk that we are redeploying. Um, staff have been spoken to, some staff have expressed some concern, not so much from a health point of view, because of course we wouldn't be asking anyone to do anything that's unsafe. And I must, must stress that point, that, that the work that we're asking people to do is safe. Um, so, but, but we are also recognising that some of the skill sets of the staff mean that they feel that some work, for example, the COVID martial work would be not within their normal skill set and would be quite uncomfortable for them. So Absolutely. we are we are identifying other roles and I do accept your point and I do accept these are people that are losing the job at the end of the process and we're very much recognising that and there has been quite a shift this week in terms of hearing that message because initially we hadn't had the one-to-ones with staff. We obviously wanted to use them in the way that would best work for the council um, and uh, get them to actually play a part in the community and there are a number of staff that are really welcoming that opportunity I have to add but there are other staff that feel that that particular role would be uncomfortable for them. And we are looking at, for example, communication roles, uh, customer services roles, IT roles and revenue and benefit roles that you would potentially describe as back office roles that those people can also work in and support. So um, those things are all being considered. And there is there is more on offer than the COVID marshal. Um, that was an area. Um, that also obviously is changing somewhat in relation to the current four week restrictions as well. So those breaking up of potential or not breaking up, but monitoring and highlighting to others, uh, groups of six, for example, is not part of the process anymore. So um, for the next four weeks, at least, and um, things are emerging there. But but I do take the point that you're making that we need to make sure that the 12 weeks notice period is comfortable for staff. It's obviously a very difficult thing to lose your job. And, uh, and indeed, we've been working closely with Eunice who've been good at expressing and supporting staff with those views and uh, I, I think you know I'd be quite happy if you want to hear from Jackie as the, our branch secretary but we are very much uh, ensuring that there are roles that people are comfortable in and they can see out their time in a positive way for them as well as the organisation. 
Yeah, if I can come in on that, I'm very pleased to hear that um, because that people's tempers do rise high a bit high, and these people are out in the street, and that could result in some very unfortunate situations because they're not happy about the situation, and members of the public right now are not happy with what's going on. Right now, do I hear from you that? Um, this, I mean, because the council are going to get so much of this furlough money, um, are you are you going to offer them a position similar or much better than originally? Um, because I feel yeah. that the council would be wise to keep on hold of some of these people because things could change in the next twelve weeks. We might be glad of their their their. Um, uh, well, furlough's going on to the end of March now, isn't it? Simon? This isn't. This doesn't relate to furlough. Yes. No. So it this, doesn't this... relate to furlough. Well, it doesn't relate to furlough in the way that you're in. In. in... No, first, no, no. First but... of all, we don't well, get furlough. One person at a time. One person at a time. Yep. So it doesn't refer to but, furlough. But, 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 furlough is an alternative to redundancy. Council going to get a certain amount of money, aren't they? So it wouldn't be a loss. A complete loss. Well, no, just, just interject to, there. Just, just to be clear, though, just if I can just deal with furlough because I want to make sure everyone's clear. Is so furlough the government will fund eighty percent of the wage in this latest round. In the last two months prior to this, so in October it was sixty percent, but you still paid eighty percent. And in the month before that, it was seventy percent, but you, you still paid eighty percent. Uh, the national right. insurance and the pension contributions are still made by the employer. So, uh, being staff being on furlough do cost the employer money. I just think it's important to be clear on that. It's not all funded from elsewhere. Um, so there is always an element of funding that comes from the council. Um, in terms of redeploying staff, that that bill would be a hundred percent pay, and there would be no furlough recovery. So that is the council paying the staff for their time. And where the work has been assessed to be at a higher grade we're adjusting pay and that will also impact on anyone's redundancy pay as well so i just need to be really clear about all of those elements but jackie if you i'm quite happy for jackie to... yeah you were going to say I, I just wanted to say that you know um as the unison representative i've been working very closely with simon on these redundancies to ensure that all staff are treated fairly and actually not put into positions that are uncomfortable and I would say unsafe for them. We've worked very, very closely to make sure that everyone is going forward in a position that works for both them and for the council. Um, there will be ongoing dis discussions next week because it is a very fast changing yeah. situation. Because as we say, we heard today that you know co um, the furlough scheme is being extended to the 31st of March next year. You know, Simon and I need to have a discussion on that as to whether or not that impacts on the actual redundancies and whether, you know, we actually look to furlough staff rather than make them redundant. And therefore, you know, say, as Stan says, save some of the actual um, people for, you know, the benefit of the council, because these people have very, very good skill sets, have devoted an awful lot of their time and their lives to working for the council and Hartford Theatre and deserved, you know, the best that they can possibly get. We, as Unison, we do absolutely understand the financial position of the theatre, you know, with the lockdown and with, you know, the potential um, as they're going to actually redevelop it. It was always going to be on the cards that there was going to be a reorganisation of the Hartford Theatre staff. We at Unison have always been aware of that. We've always worked very closely with HR and management to make sure that, you know, all the best practices are put into place. Um, going forward, we'll do our absolute best to protect our staff and our members. And I just want to reassure all councillors that we are actually doing this and working very, very closely with HR. So, you know, you. if you do have any questions for me, I'm quite happy to take them. Thank you. Thank no, you very I'm much. very pleased to hear that. Thank you, Chairman, for that. Thank you. All right. OK, thank you. Just, just um, to add one thing, Councillor, yep. uh, sorry, Chairman. Um, what, what I want to also make clear is, and I think Jackie said it quite well, but things do emerge along the way. And actually, one of the key points about a consultation process is to listen. 
and to hear what staff have got to say. So you can start with a, with a particular package, but actually meaningful consultation shows that you do listen. And as part of that process, the staff are still being trained on Friday in preparation for a COVID martial role. So I wouldn't want anyone to go out of this meeting and start telling staff where they're going to end up because that would be inappropriate. But what I'm, more, more I'm saying is we're asking staff to look at the area and decide, and then to give us feedback on the Monday following that training. So that's the process we're going through. So as Jackie said, there is discussions next week. I think it's highly likely there will be a very small number that go into the COVID martial role in reality. And we've made sure we've identified opportunities for that. But obviously our first goal was to put them into the most meaningful role in terms of supporting the community. And of course, Hartford Theatre was a community service itself as well. So it's not as far-fetched as maybe it might appear. And also want to make clear that the role never involved them tackling members of the public. In fact, we would never put anyone into that situation unless they're part of the enforcement team. And it, it was about being eyes and ears and referring matters to the police or referring matters to the enforcement team as appropriate. Most of it was actually engaging with businesses rather than members of public where, where we, before we were in the restrictions and then the other side of it would have been actually being a physical presence at, at a park and open space area which just by being there tends to make people behave more sensibly while you're there. So I just want to be clear okay. there you know you. you can read a lot into the term COVID martial and unless you really know what it involves and that's half the issue of this you can't judge it and that's why we're talking to staff we're engaging with staff we're training staff but then we're ultimately listening particularly to the staff from Hartford Theatre as a special bunch because they are the people potentially going to be losing their jobs in this process so we do not want to have a 12-week period that bites us or opens up or upsets staff does that make sense thank I just you. want to be clear thank you Simon um, we've got fine cancer. thank you Thank you, Councillor Ball. Um, Councillor DeMont and then Councillor Alder. Thank you, um, Chairman. And, and thank you, Councillor Ball, for, for raising this point about this stuff. And, and I do apologise, Simon and Jackie, if I've missed the point. So I do apologise if I'm asking you to, to repeat yourself. But where I'm reading 6.3 that a number of staff were furloughed and that is ending, now it's been extended. I don't quite understand um, what our approach of the furlough with these staff is. Have we said they can't have the furlough extended or just... I mean, it might be me, but I didn't quite understand why the furlough isn't relevant. The so extension think, of it. First of all, the extension to March has happened today. And as Jackie's just said, we haven't had an opportunity to speak. Jackie's emailed me asking to speak if you really want to be completely mm -hmm. transparent on this. And I haven't had the time to get back to her today. So uh, we will catch up at some point tomorrow. You're at least letting me say that to Jackie in the room. So thank you. But <laughs> secondly, um, is that we when it was extended by the four week period that really didn't change the game and and no members were particularly even asking to go on furlough we had determined to continue to furlough the casual staff when that opportunity arose the job uh, the jjs scheme was of no benefit whatsoever to us in this situation so we weren't going to go into that alternative scheme which is obviously still being talked about as coming in now after uh, march um the the reality is, is that we have taken an approach previously with staff um, that we furloughed that they could make a choice of whether they wanted to be redeployed at 100% of pay or whether they wanted to go into furlough. Um, we obviously changed that when we thought they were all coming back from furlough, which of course they did. Um, and um, we then started flexing them back off furlough and paying them to attend meetings. And, and whenever we've asked them to engage in work, we've paid them for their time at their 100% rate and that hasn't been on furlough. So we've already had staff from the theatre not on furlough until the end of October by flexing them in and out as we needed to engage with them. Obviously, why we were doing that was in preparation for furlough ending and for the theatre not being in a position to accommodate all of those staff because of the reduction in the work at the theatre and also because of the COVID safety required at the theatre. Um, I, I don't want to presuppose, and I think it would be wrong for an officer to presuppose what my conversation would be with uh, Jackie and the union tomorrow. I think we need to look at the options, but the reality is there is also work that needs to be done and we have the opportunity to redeploy staff and pay them 100% of pay. I think if you want my honest opinion, it's difficult to see how the extension to the, the furlough scheme changes things because actually furlough is effectively where you're starving off a redundancy. We know that that redundancy is going to be required um, subject to consultation because of what we've just discussed, the reduction in work at the theatre and then the uh, ultimate closure of the theatre for the refurbishment that's planned in August. So um, the reality is furlough may stretch things out longer 
Um, but what the union have also been saying, and I, I've really appreciated this point that they've made, is that the redeployment is equally an opportunity for staff to start developing some new skills, get involved in some different areas of work, and actually, hopefully, land a permanent role in that area as potentially roles emerge during the 12-week process. So I think there's actually a danger, potentially, of putting staff back on furlough, um, actually, from a wellbeing point of view as well. As well. But, but we need to look at this stuff quite carefully. We have also said that if we're redeploying staff temporarily into roles in their notice period and that work continues beyond their notice period, we will look at extending their notice period to allow them to continue to work. And obviously we will look to do that sooner rather than later because obviously they're unlikely to be available for work if we don't give them plenty of notice on that sort of thing. So it's all to play for at the moment. We aren't, we aren't trying to lose staff. And if we can redeploy the staff, we certainly will on a permanent basis when I say that. But at the moment, we're managing a 12 week process, which we haven't got to yet, because actually we're still at the end. We're still in our consultation period, I must add. So there are things being discussed and, and the latest uh, twist, shall we say, in relation to the furlough scheme will be part of that consultation process. And the union have already raised it, as I've said. Thank you. Thank you. That answers the question. Good. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Devon. <laughs> Councillor Alder. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to ask, really a matter of information, um, fur furlough is 80% of, of pay and the employer paying the remaining 20%. Are we actually paying the no, remaining 20%, which I presume we are? Um, and then I had a further question on, on 7.5 about the daily mindfulness sessions. I just wondered if you'd had any feedback as to the numbers of people participating in that. Thank you. So first of all, the, the furlough scheme actually requires you to pay an employee 80% of their wage up to a cap of two and a half thousand pounds. Um, that was adjusted, as I described earlier, uh, in the months of, um, sorry, October and then prior to that, September. And in fact, as early as August, they stopped uh, the NI and the pension contributions being part of it. So the employer has to pay 80% of the wage, not 100% of the wage. And, and up to August, they were able to claim back fully the 80% that they paid to staff. Um, what, what you couldn't claim back anymore was the national insurance and a proportion of the pension. It was a very small proportion in East Hearts because we pay around 23% into a pension scheme and what we were able to claim back was 3%. So you're always paying an additional 20% for the pension and you were paying national insurance and then full pension in due course. Then in those last two months of the existing scheme, you had to put in 10% and then you had to put in 20% to make up to the 80%. There was never a requirement for an employer to pay 100%. And when we offered staff in the theatre the opportunity to go on furlough, and I know that may sound like a, faint, a strange way of putting it, but what we did is initially we explored redeployment with them all because we didn't believe as a local authority we could use the furlough scheme. Then when we got the clarity from the LGA that we could use the furlough scheme, we contacted them all again and uh, all bar one asked to go on furlough on 80% of their salary as opposed to being redeployed on 100% of their salary and potentially their pay being topped up. So that's how it has worked. It hasn't changed. And we balance that in our eyes uh, uh, in terms of officers that actually paying people 80 percent and not topping up to pay was helpful in terms of the morale staff that were still working, who were receiving 100 percent of pay. And the resentment that you can potentially cause by people having 100 percent of pay, but not working alongside colleagues that are potentially falling over with the level of work that they have to do. So that was our balance that we struck in terms of that matter. In terms of the mindfulness sessions in August, um, I believe that they was they were popular. Um, I can't give you precise numbers. Um, that would have been a brilliant question for me to have in front of Vicky because this is, well-being is her area of lead. Um, but I can say that the, the, the feedback that we have had from some staff has been very positive. Mindfulness as an exercise can be very helpful from a well-being point of view. And I think those staff that weren't particularly aware of it have found it very useful as a tool for them to consider going forward but it, I did it, actually attend those Simon and they were very helpful thank mindfulness you, was something that I never discussed before and it was quite an interesting it's quite session. a different way of doing it isn't it yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and also just to say on the you know the constantly changing aspects of furlough 
Simon and I have been having very regular conversations because it seems as soon as we actually sit down and settle on a particular way forward with something, um, something else comes along and changes the whole scenario. So we will be looking to have a meeting next week to discuss the changing aspects of furlough and how this actually potentially will impact on the actual um, potential redundancies at Hartford Theatre. So it is an ongoing thing and we have worked very, very closely to try and find as many redeployment opportunities for the staff as possible. And we'll continue as the union support to do that for all staff. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know, I, I find it so reassuring that we've got a great HR team who really have the welfare of the staff at their heart and are working so closely with the unions. I think that's really reassuring. And I thank you both very much. I know you've got teams and other people behind you, but it's good to have that out here in the open just, just, for us to see. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think the, the key point for me and, and, and you know, what in HR, we have to work as, as an organisational support, but how do you get the best for your organisation? It's, it's how do you get the best out of your staff and how do you get the best out of your staff is by treating staff fairly and appropriately and supporting them to give of their best. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. In, 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 in also in our branch secretary, Jackie, and I, I know this could be seen as a bit of a loving and I really don't want it to be seen like that, but, <laughs> but um, we have a branch secretary that has the ability to think about things organisationally as well as individually memberly, if I could put it like that. And that's that really important as well, yeah. because it, 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 we are in this together. We are one team and, you know, we can't we can't protect those jobs at the theatre. There is no work there. It is a genuine redundancy situation in terms of the diminishing level but we will do our best to support staff and it may be that we can only support them for the 12 week notice period but we will do our best to make sure that's comfortable and that's what we do recognize and you know Richard as our chief exec is behind this as well you know anything that I do with Jackie in the end gets ratified elsewhere as well and I'm just saying there is a joined up approach yeah. to this but we obviously have a lot of conflicting priorities on our time and everything else as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's not an easy time for anyone. No, thank you. Councillor Newton, you have you your show hand you could be Councillor Newton was first. I'm, I'm really interested in the mindfulness. I don't know a lot about it. I'm wondering whether it'd be pertinent if we were to... I'd like to know about it. This is a bit of sort of from the far, far side coming in. Can you, Simon, give me some information on it? Yeah. I think it might be useful. Yeah. Is that worth something having outside the meeting, do you think? Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll send an email to Councillor Newton. No, that, that's what I think you're well, asking, isn't it? Well, to all we'll committee get... members. That would oh, okay. Them. We'll, we'll get you some proper information on it then, yeah. I, I'm sure we've got some tips and tricks that actually, because uh, Tina, Tina no, Wilson used to run it. Claire, 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 Claire is the lead on this. She's brilliant. Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah they, I was going to say Claire you. Pullen and Vicky will be behind the current delivery, but I believe we've run some sessions previously as well, and we've got some so we've got some slides and some presentations on the matter that we can share with you. Yeah, and right. obviously yeah, we can see this as support for members. Full stop. Anyway, if, if you, you wish to see it that way. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Demont. You want just to a come? really quick one. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I suppose as the member for physical activities and. Uh, a keen sight to myself. It's just nice to see, especially with lockdown coming and, and a lot of our gyms unfortunately closed. It's just nice to see the council taking advantage of the change of the rules on um, a cycle to work and doubling the amount that people can can spend on a bike. I think, yeah, it's a very very positive thing for us to do, and I hope I hope lots of our staff um, take that up. Uh, it, uh, the only thing I would just point out slightly in a sort of cheeky way on that is that mainly the, the, the doubling up of the prices to allow them to buy e-bikes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint on the physical activity side, <laughs> but of course, from a sustainability point of view, it's a fantastic initiative. <laughs> do, do you know what? You still have to pedal and the well-being you get from being out in the fresh air yeah. on yeah, a bike. Fresh air. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm good. I'm glad you can yeah. see the whole <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Have we got any more hands up? Anyone want to say anything else? It doesn't look like it to me. No, Chair, I can't see any. Let's see. Will had his hand, head in his hands earlier, so we're coming to the near the end of the meeting No, now. I'm just scribbling Wait. away. Don't worry. I, I know. Um, so we're noting that report. If no one's got anything to say, that's it. Thank you. Item number 10 is urgent business. I have heard nothing at all. Will, have you had anything? No, sorry. No, well, that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. It's been another enjoyable Human Resources Committee meeting. Thank you very much. I can only apologise for my screen freezing up earlier, but um, 
we're still finishing at 